It's Chicago's most beloved department store of all time, a towering, elegant emporium on State Street, and its founder, Marshall Field, is regarded as one of the greatest retailers of all time, the father of the modern department store. Field was a self-made millionaire who helped to spearhead Chicago's growth into a major city. They say that timing is everything, and in the story of Marshall Fields, timing is everything. There was the time the main road by the Field family farm closed, forcing Marshall Fields' father to sell the farm in Massachusetts. Fields' plan to become a farmer, well, that couldn't happen any longer. When Field was 17, he got a job working in a nearby dry goods store. He lived above the store and learned the business. Five years later, he headed west and settled himself in Chicago. The timing was perfect. Chicago was a city about to become the hub of the Midwest. Field took a job in another shop, saving all he could. When an ailing Potter Palmer, who owned the successful P. Palmer & Company dry goods store, approached Field and his business partner, Levi Leiter, about joining forces, he quickly seized the opportunity. Thus, the building on State Street was renamed Field Palmer Leiter & Company. The two eventually bought out Palmer and found tremendous success. But there were hard times too, like the time their building on State and Washington burned in the Chicago Fire of 1871. But because of some dedicated workers, a lot of the store's records and expensive merchandise was saved, being carted out by wagon load after wagon load to Leiter's house. They were back in business within a few weeks. They moved into the Singer Sewing Machine building two years later, but that too was a casualty to another fire in 1877. But Field would not be defeated. He bought the new Singer building, rebuilt in the same spot, and set up shop. In 1881, Field bought out Leiter, and the business was rebranded as Marshall Field & Company. In 1887, a seven-story wholesale store on Franklin Street was built to sell merchandise to smaller merchants throughout the U.S. This wholesale side of things proved to be incredibly profitable for Field. In 1893, a new nine-story annex building was constructed on Wabash in preparation for the influx of people that would be coming for the World's Fair. Several more buildings were added over the years until an entire square block was filled. At the time, this 73-acre store, all 300,000 square feet of it, was the world's largest department store. It had the largest book, china, shoe, and toy departments in the world. It also had the world's largest Tiffany glass dome ceiling, which took 50 artisans two years to complete. There are over 1.6 million pieces of iridescent glass that covers 6,000 square feet. And what most Chicagoans remember was the magnificent Christmas displays that ushered in the holiday season for shoppers. The trumpets, the window displays, the lights, the garland, and that 45-foot tree. It's the stuff that's etched into our collective memories. Field had a mastermind for marketing. His store had two grounding principles. One, the customer is always right. And two, give the lady what she wants. There was a new middle class emerging in Chicago, and the middle class women had money to spend he hired young women as sales clerks and utilized electric lights as soon as they were available. Fields was an innovator, introducing the one-price system, accessible goods that customers were free to browse, and a liberal return policy. He offered home delivery and started an interior decoration department. His store was for those with good taste. Fields had a reputation for high quality and great fashion. This stemmed in large part from the products he imported from overseas. Fields had buyers in Europe that shipped merchandise to him to ensure the latest fashions were available. He offered the finest china and elegant, beautiful furniture. And it didn't stop there. 
When the streetcar was first introduced, Field invested in the line to make sure that the train stopped right in front of his store. He was the first to display merchandise in the window to entice customers to come inside. He was the first to create the bargain basement. Fields was the department store by which all others were measured. The concept that Fields blueprinted and executed was copied by anyone who opened a department store. There's a great story about how the Walnut Room, the famous restaurant in the Chicago store, was added. Initially, Field had no desire to be in the restaurant business, but a moment in time changed that. One of his saleswomen, Mrs. Herring, had a strong clientele base of Chicago ladies. One day, one of her clients was tuckered out from shopping. Mrs. Herring, trained in the the give-the-lady-what-she-wants philosophy, offered her customer her own lunch, a chicken pot pie made from her grandmother's recipe. It was so delicious, the woman asked if Mrs. Herring would bring more pot pies the following day to serve her friends after they shopped. Mrs. Herring orchestrated the catered lunch with linens and sterling silver and served her home-baked chicken pot pies. Field heard laughter coming from his back room, filled with delighted ladies having lunch. Talk about good timing. Field decided to open a tea room. That would later be followed by several restaurants on the seventh floor, including the famed Walnut Room. Marshall Field died in 1906 as the wealthiest man in Chicago, but his influence on his beloved Chicago was more than just his namesake. He pushed for the development of the downtown. He wanted to make Chicago a great cultural and education center. He helped to found the Art Institute, he donated land for the first University of Chicago building, and he gave millions to build a natural history museum for the 1893 Columbian Exposition World's Fair. This would later become the Field Museum of Natural History, which today remains as one of Chicago's top attractions. Many years later, his company also donated $3 million to build the Shedd Aquarium, which is adjacent to the Field Museum. John Shedd actually took over as president after Field's death and oversaw the expansion projects and growth for the next 16 years. After a number of other acquisitions, Marshall Fields acquired Seattle-based department store Frederick & Nelson in 1929, and with it came Frango Mints. Sales were slumping in Chicago as the country moved into the Great Depression, and there was hope that those little chocolates could provide a sales boost. A candy kitchen with large melting pots found its new home on the 13th floor and remained there for 70 years. Expansions into suburbs and shopping malls happened in the second half of the century. Those green shopping bags found their way into the hands and hearts of shoppers across the country. And no story about Marshall Fields would be complete without mentioning those iconic clocks. The great clock hanging street side became a Chicago icon in and of itself. Field originally wanted the clock to serve as a beacon for his store, which he hoped would become a meeting place for Chicagoans. The first was installed in 1897, with another added a few years later. The flagship building in Chicago was declared a National Historic Landmark and was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1978 and it was designated as a Chicago landmark in 2005. But times do change, and all good things eventually do come to an end. Fields was purchased in 2005 by Federated Department Stores, and most stores were rebranded as Macy's by the next year. But for many, the memories of shopping at the great Marshall Fields will always be timeless. Thanks for watching Memory Mountain. If you enjoyed this video, please click to subscribe to our channel and hit that thumbs up button. Be sure to tap the notification bell so you'll be one of the first to know when we post our next story looking back over the landscape of Americana.